You know, I interviewed Lou Gossett Jr. a few years ago, and he said how much he had wanted to do a sequel to Officer and a Gentleman. Hmm. Also re interviewed Richard Gere. He said it didn't really interest him. Uh, I'm not sure what Deborah Winger's feelings are, although I can ask her in a couple weeks. But given everything that went on with that movie, is that something, that film one that you think would lend itself to a sequel? I don't think so. Um, Paramount came to me and wanted to do a sequel, and I wasn't interested. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think that that film made a statement, and um, it was a terrific experience. Uh, but I think that the idea of sequels, sequels, sequels that are going on now, um, you know, sometimes, occasionally, if you have a kind of epic story a la The Godfather to tell, a sequel is in order. Most often it's a kind of commercial follow-up, and I think that, you know, in that instance, how could we be more successful than the original? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you're kind of dooming yourself to failure if you try. And second of all, I, I think that the story, I mean, in a way, uh, Don Simpson, who was the president of production at Paramount, did the sequel to uh, Officer and Gentleman, called it Top Gun. And, you know, he basically, you know, went to fly. He always, Don Simpson wanted us to do the sequel, and I said no. So he then left uh, Paramount, became an independent producer, and produced Top Gun, and kind of said, okay, I'll do a different story, and, and, and that's it. Uh, and it was very successful, so who am I to know? You know Taylor, uh, I was watching The Idolmaker again <laughs> recently, and I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that film. Uh, the lessons I, it taught me about the music industry. All right. Was that a really enjoyable experience for you doing that film, or was that more of a, a, um, an introduction to the movie making process for you? Well, The Idolmaker was my first film, and of course, uh, when you made documentaries in your past and you get an opportunity to, to direct a feature film, I mean, I would have paid them for the opportunity. <laughs> it was like a dream come true. But The Idolmaker, I, I wrote two drafts of the script. I mean, I, do, I knew a lot about the history of rock and roll and about that particular milieu, and it was, a, it was really fun. It, it was a vibrant film. I wanted it to have a real punch in life because the characters were young and vibrant. And, and uh, you know, for me, it was a chance to look at a milieu uh, of my youth. Uh, I grew up listening to rock and roll. I loved it. I mean, all that process. Uh, you know, it was a chance to revisit that and, and put, give my take and spin on it. Um, and I thought Ray Sharkey and, and Peter Gallagher and Paul Land, I thought all the characters in the film were, were uh, terrific. It was, we were all unknowns and nobody, you know, we, the Idolmaker didn't do particularly well. But um, it's nice, in a way, cable and cassettes, the, the film comes back, you know, to haunt you. <laughs> you know, when The Shining came out, um, there was a bit written up about Stephen King at that time did not like the film version of that book. Years later he said he, he judged it differently. Hmm. Uh, was that on your mind at all whether or not Stephen King would like this film or did you have any dealings with him at all? Or? Stephen King and I have corresponded. When I got the film uh, he wrote me a very lovely letter um, and uh, wished me well. But he's a very private man and he never came to the set. He was certainly welcome. Uh, you know, I, he's, he's an incredible phenomenon. I mean the man produces bestseller after bestseller and uh, and obviously has an immense amount of talent. This film doesn't fit into the phantasmagorical horror genre that Stephen King is so well known for. But on the other hand, he created characters here that are fascinating. And Tony Gilroy, who did the adaptation of the screenplay, he, he adapted it from the novel, did a brilliant job because the character of Selena, the grown-up Selena, played by Jennifer Jason Lee, doesn't exist in Stephen King's book. So. In a way, I, I read the book after I read the script and went, oh my goodness, this is very interesting. But, you know, to Stephen King's credit, he's a very classy guy. I mean, he could have responded any which way to Tony's script. And he said, hey, that's a great idea. I like it. And that was it. So, you know, in a way, this is a man who has had many opportunities to have, his, probably more than any other author, author, to have his films turned into, his books turned into films. And uh, he's seeing the film on Tuesday. And I, ha I, of course, I'm a little nervous. Uh, you know, I'd like to know what he thinks. But uh, basically, he gave me a great gift in that he left me alone, wasn't just looking over my shoulder, and basically, I was able to make the film the way I saw fit. I tried to be true to the spirit of his book, believe me, and I hope I did. And uh, you know, we'll see what he says.